Okay, so many of us have been doing church, well, differently. Sunday mornings have become a bit more casual. Living rooms and coffee shops have become sanctuaries. And fellowship has a new, less personal touch. It hasn't been easy. Yet, here we are, gathering, worshiping, learning, being the church. Now more than ever, we're reminded of a simple truth. The church is not a building. It's the body of Christ. It isn't built with brick and mortar, but with faith and hope. In the midst of uncertainty, our calling remains the same, to share the truth of the gospel with a world God loves. Throughout history, the church has prospered in difficult times, and today is no different. We are still the church. We're just doing things a bit differently. Welcome to Valpo FUMC Online. My name is Mark, and I'm the online campus pastor here at Valparaiso First United Methodist Church. That means I'm here for you. And I'm here for you because you matter to God. You matter to God, and you matter to us. We are five weeks into a six-week sermon series called Reset. The series is about resetting our life and character in some specific areas. If you've missed any of the previous ones, that's no problem. You can go back and watch them on our YouTube channel. The channel is on the screen. You can also go to our church website at valpofumc.org and then click on resources and then on sermons. Once you're there, just click on the current series and you'll be able to find the one you missed. So far, Pastor Kevin Miller has talked about resetting our faith, our worship, our heart, and our character. Today, he's speaking on resetting the church. Pastor Kevin writes, how does God communicate with you? How do you communicate with God? Yes, many feel connected to God through nature. Primarily, people say on a golf course, at their favorite lake, campground, or nature trail. But what is God's plan and method to communicate and connect with His people? How are we doing with it? And how do we reset the church for today's challenges and opportunities? Here's Pastor Kevin. Well, hi, and welcome back as we continue our Reset series. We've been exploring a reset in our lives, and I hope you've been following along and 
and doing a reset in your life. It involves diving into God's word and finding out why, in the first place, are we invited to reset our faith, our worship, our hearts, our very character. But the aim here, the, the, the so that, is that you discover for yourself that this is not something you do. This reset is something that's in our hearts, but it's something that God does. And it's something that God has done. It's something that God is doing even in this moment and that God will continue to do because God is in the habit of loving and providing mercy. And God is in the habit of keeping his promises. Now, as part of God's promise and his movement in the world, he created the church. He created the church as a way for his word, his plan, and his people to meet him, to have an encounter with him, to worship him, and to go out and change the world, not through a building or even not through the internet, but through his people, through simple people like you and I. I came across an article on the Associated Press website. Uh, it fell under odd news, but here's a story out of Cumberland, Rhode Island. The Rhode Island Health Department says that it was not able to definitively confirm or refute the presence of Santa in a young girl's home after she requested to have a partially eaten cookie and a couple of gnawed on carrot sticks tested for DNA to find out if Santa is real. The department tweeted uh, last week that we all agree that something magical may be at play. The department said it found no complete matches to anyone in the combined DNA index system, but said there was a partial match to a 1947 case centered around 34th Street in New York City. It said that it would need more DNA samples from other known Santa encounters to make a definitive match. The girl is a Cumberland, Rhode Island resident, had sent the cookie and carrot sticks to the town's police department to ask if they could be tested for DNA. And the police chief forwarded the evidence to the state's Department of Health Forensic Science Unit for analysis. Now, I think that's a great story for a couple reasons. Number one, the truth really is stranger than fiction. But secondly, that a little girl in Rhode Island desperately wants to know about the reality of Santa Claus. And in the same way, people, adults, in our heart of hearts, are desperately looking for evidence of a real God. Now, throughout history, the best place to find God at work, the best place to find evidence of God at work and for his purpose has been the local church. Uh, now, yes, you can encounter God in lots of different ways. You can encounter God outdoors, as many people have told me over the years. You can encounter God on a golf course or in a fishing boat or in nature. However, if your only encounter with God is in these places, you're missing out on the best part of a relationship with God. Now, the fastest growing religion in America today, other than people who list none, are those who describe themselves as spiritual, but not religious. Now, my own experience with this group that includes people in my own family is that they won't provide an adequate definition of, of what it means to be spiritual or religious. Now, the English word that we use, religion, derives from the Latin word religio, which is defined uh, like this, 
an encounter, reverence, or devotion to the divine. Now, the word spirituality is defined as the practices that transform us to be more like the divine. And so we can define Christian spirituality like this, the practices that transform us to be more like Jesus. So how do we define Christianity? Christianity should be an encounter with God that transforms us to be more like Jesus, the one who chose to serve rather than be served. And yes, this can happen in various places, but the primary vehicle that God provided is the church. Now, the church is, is not any one person's idea. It's not an invention that some person came up with. Uh, but the idea is that a bunch of like-minded people or a group of people with the same questions would come together once a week or more. Initially, it was daily, but would come together on a regular basis to sing songs or sing from psalms, to pray and to share together and learn about this God that we can only find in the Bible. This is a God who created the universe, a God who led his chosen people out of bondage and out of slavery and into freedom. A God who heard the loud and confused cries of the people and so sent prophets to speak to them. A God who, when the people ignored those prophets, still loved the world so much that he sent his only son into the world so that the world would know. But then when the world destroyed his son, he proved his love by to, for us by retrieving Jesus from the depths of death claiming his lordship not only over life, but also over death. Now, it was this Jesus who first established the idea of church. In Matthew 16, he's having a conversation with the disciples over the question of who others say that he is, who Jesus is. And then he turns to the disciples and says, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And it's, it's Peter who looks at Jesus for the first time and says, you are, you are Lord. And so Jesus says, I think with a smile, he turns to Peter, whose name was Simon at the time, and he, he re renamed him and makes a promise. He said, you are Peter. The word that he would have used is Petros or rock. So you are Peter, the rock, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so as we read on, starting in Acts through the New Testament, we read about the best and the worst examples of what it means to be the church. The church at its best in my opinion, is reflected in Romans 12. The church at its worst gets a little bit more print, we, but I would invite you to take a look at 1 Corinthians chapters 3, 5, and 6. It's a messed up church. Today, we are living during a time when the church in America and the United Methodist Church is at a tipping point. Reverend Dr. Timothy Keller is the founding pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in Manhattan in New York. He started the church in 1989 with his wife, Kathy, and for 28 years, he grew a very diverse congregation of young professionals up to a, a church that on a weekly basis, 5,000 people would attend per worship there. Later on, he became chairman and co-founder of Redeemer City to City, uh, which has planted thriving churches in major markets all over the world. As a matter of fact, 
Timothy Keller is more uh, responsible for planting more thriving churches around the world in the last 20 years than all of the United Methodist Church. Now, despite not too long ago being diagnosed with stage four pan pancreatic cancer, he continues to be a prolific writer and speaker and, and guests on podcasts. And I heard him last week and a lot of the things that he, he talked about uh, prompted what I'm sharing today. A magazine called Christianity Today has written about Tim Keller. 50 years from now, Tim Keller will be remembered as a pioneer of the new urban Christians. Now, recently he released an essay uh, that he's made freely available over the internet, but it's exhaustively and extensively researched, and it's entitled The Decline and Renewal of the American Church. And it is, in, in my opinion, a modern epistle for today's churches. We need to take a close look at this. Tim Keller is living, in effect, as a, in, in a prison of stage four pancreatic cancer. And so he's not writing this to fulfill a contract or to stay busy. He's writing this out of the depths of love for the American church. When Paul wrote from a jail about what was going on in, in the churches, I'm sure his heart was broken. And I get the impression that as Tim Keller researched this, this essay and, and wrote it several times, he had to stop and use a tissue. Keller writes about the uniqueness of Christianity and that we have denied what he calls our Christian particularities. Now, I'll get to the particularities in a moment, but let's ask ourselves a question first. What is the purpose of religion? Well, remember I said a few minutes ago that religion is defined as an encounter, reverence, or devotion to the divine. In our case, our encounter, reverence, and devotion to God. So Keller draws from a man named Dean Kelly, who wrote about the purpose of religion almost 30 years ago. And at the time, Kelly was a legal scholar and writer for the National Council of Churches. And here's what he wrote about the appeal of religion. The appeal of religion is that it provides large scale meanings, which is more than just helping others and volunteering. But largest scale meanings enables people to face suffering and death with confidence and hope and to seek the longest term common good, making sacrifices for it. And then he writes this, the only largest scale meanings are those offered and validated by religion, a life of shared faith, meaning, forgiveness, love, and spiritual gro growth in God. So what makes Christianity unique? Or as Tim Keller writes, what are the Christian particularities? Well, we, we saw these on the video that preceded uh, this today. It's called the Apostles Creed. Maybe you're familiar with it, but I would invite you to go back and watch that, that video again. This is an ancient creed that was written many centuries ago about what we believe. It's a statement of belief. We use it often at the beginning of our worship in our sanctuary. Um, but it's not just a statement of, of faith. These, these are the things that make our faith particular, such as the virgin birth of Jesus, that Jesus pre-existed and was one with God, that on the cross he achieved atonement or at one -ment with God. And finally, the bodily resurrection, that our bodies will be resurrected at some point in the future. As a matter of fact, Tim Keller points out that it is these particularities that modern science objects to. 
Now, if you if you follow the science, as people like to say today, these don't make any sense, which, by the way, is exactly the point of faith. Faith is believing in those things that you cannot see. This is exactly why the Apostle Paul wrote to the misdirected church in Corinth. He wrote, for the message about the cross is foolish, foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the church at its best. This is the church in need of renewal. This is the church in need of a reset. This is the church in need of revival. Now, when I say revival, what most Christians think about, their hearts drop because what they think about is going out and knocking on doors or standing on a street corner and handing out tracts or holding tent meetings in the middle of the summer. Now, the United States, America, is in the midst of what is known as the post-Christian era. We live in a time that author and scholar J. Gresham Metchen refers to as de-supernaturalized Christianity. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, de-supernaturalized Christianity is that which has really relinquished everything distinctive about Christianity so that what remains is in essentials only that same indefinite type of religious aspiration present before Christianity came upon the scene. And then he writes, here, as in many other areas of life, it appears that the things that are sometimes thought to be the hardest to defend are also the things that are most worth defending. Now, I believe with Tim Keller, as he points out in his essay, that we are in the midst of a cosmic reset of the church. I believe that revival is happening and that revival will happen, but just not in the way that we think it may, or certainly in the way that it has in the past. But I also strongly believe that just as the little girl in Rhode Island was looking for real evidence of Santa Claus, the people that we see every day are looking for real evidence of God, looking for real evidence of a Savior. Long before any of us came along, Christianity was and is and will remain wholly different. Biblical Christianity insists that we are saved not by what we do, but by what God in Christ has done for us in his incarnation, in his life, in his death, in his resurrection, in his ascension. Without these, the reality is that Christianity is just another thoughtful religion with the same impact on our communities as the local service clubs. But if our Christian faith is based on what makes the church particular, remember these? Then the good news is that it is not faith that saves us, but the object of our faith. Let me say that again. It is not faith that saves us, but the object of our faith, which is Jesus Christ. Faith, then, at its core is a gift of God. Worship is our collective response to this gift. And our hearts and character are our response back to what God is, has done and is doing and will do. To have faith in Jesus is to quit trying to work so hard at winning God's favor by our own actions, by our own works, but to simply accept him as a gift from God. The result of this faith is a reset, a new life. And this reset is that our salvation is an absolutely free gift of God. 
And so the question again is, are you ready to reset? One of the greatest prayers for revival and renewal that we find in the Bible is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was a prophet who lived long ago, but we find a lot of connections between uh, Jesus and Isaiah, even 400 years before Jesus was even born. But I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bible to Isaiah 64. I'm going to read Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9, and then jump ahead to Isaiah 65, verse 1. And I'm asking that this prayer be your prayer. And listen for God's response. In the end, God hears us. And in the end, God will hear us. But it will be because not because we're so good, but because of God's amazing grace. This is not a prayer that we can say to prompt revival, but it's something that God does. And so follow along with me in Isaiah 64, verses 1 through 9, and then verse 1 of chapter 65. Oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, so that the mountains would quake at your presence, as when the fire kindles brushwood and the fire causes water to boil, to make your name known to your adversaries, so that the nations might tremble at your presence. When you did awesome deeds that we did not expect, you came down, you came down. The mountains quaked at your presence. From ages past, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who works for those who wait for them. You meet those who gladly do right, those who remember you in your ways. But you were angry and we sinned because you hid yourself. We transgressed. We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a filthy cloth. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. There is no one who calls on your name or attempts to take hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have delivered us into the hand of our iniquity." Yet, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are our potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be exceedingly angry, O Lord, and do not remember iniquity forever. Now consider, we are all your people, says the prophet. And then in chapter 65, verse 1, here's God's work in revival. I was ready to be sought out by those who did not ask, says the Lord, to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that did not call on my name. It's God who renews your heart. And when this happened, when God renews our hearts, we will look back and realize that even our repentance, even during the time of our repentance, we were still filled with sin. Yet, God chose to love us anyway. God came to us not because we're so great or we're so faithful, but because he is faithful and it is his love that lasts forever. You know, if you're watching this online, we do this in person every week in our sanctuary. And so I record this on Wednesday and it's, it's hard to measure feedback. But if you've watched this far into the sermon, then it tells me that you're looking for something that maybe you're not finding on your own. Maybe you're like the little girl who, in Rhode Island who, who wants to desperately know that Santa Claus is real. Like I said, there are a lot of people 
A lot of people may be watching this who desperately want to know that there is a God who loves them deeply. There is a God who loves you deeply. And as I said last week, this God knows that you are somebody. There's an old saying that says, if, if God has your picture on his refrigerator, I believe that. God loves you with a special kind of love. And so if this is something you've been seeking, I want to encourage you to get out from behind your, your phone or your computer, however you're watching this today, and take a step into a local church. Maybe there's one down the street from you. Maybe there's one a couple of miles away. from. Maybe you've got some friends who are looking for a church. They're all made up of people, and people aren't perfect. So if you're out there looking for the perfect church, you're not going to find it. So just go find a church where you feel at home, where you feel welcome, where you can find the presence of God and the people who will open their arms and love you as you are and accept you just as God accepts you. That church is out there waiting for you. And I want to encourage you, even, even beg you to not give up on that. Keep seeking, keep searching. And if you're struggling to find that, then feel free to reach out to one of, to either Pastor Mark or, or myself. And no matter where you are, we'll help you connect to a local church who will love you with the love of Christ. Let's pray together. Lord, you are the one who is faithful. You are the one who loved us before we even knew what love was. Out of great love, you sent your son into the world so that you would know our pain, you would know our struggles, you would know what it's like to walk among the rocks and the dry, barren fields. And so, Lord, we, your people, seek to be a little bit more like Jesus. And I pray for anyone who's watching this that they would take that next step. Uh, you know where they are right now. You know how this works. And, and even through this format, Lord, we trust in you that you can work. And so I pray for that one who is seeking you, that they would step out from behind their fear and their computer and find that, that church, that body of Christ, what your word calls the bride of Christ, where they are welcomed and learn more about you and move into that relationship that just doesn't make a difference today, but makes a difference for all eternity. And so we commend all this into your good and great and merciful hands, Lord, we pray in the name of Christ our Lord and all God's people said, Amen. Well, I thank you so much for joining us, as I say, in person. Uh, I say God is good, to which the response is all the time. And all the time, God is good. And so uh, we want to be here for you. We want to pray for you. We want to help you as you step out in faith. And so look, please let us know if there's any way that we can help support you during this time. Thank you for joining us for uh, this worship service. Uh, God bless you this week. Have a, have a great week. And uh, may you go in peace. I'm Pastor Kevin. God bless you.